When I established Blackmore Gallery, my primary objective was to showcase a wide range of contemporary ceramics and sculptures. I have to have a real affinity with the works that I sell in the gallery, and I've admired and collected Peter's work for many, many years. So he was obviously the first artist that I was going to approach. My appreciation for his work stems from the way he's devoted much of his life to absorbing ancient and modern techniques and cultural influences from around the world, which has resulted in the creation of completely individual works. I'm Peter Hayes, I'm a ceramic sculptor. I worked right in the centre of Bath in an old toll bridge that I took over 30 years ago and I've converted it into a studio. The joy of it is it's right by the river and it's right in the centre of town. It's a perfect place for me to work because I can use the river as part of my art programme. I went to Moses School of Art when I was 13 years old and that meant that after three years I could go to the Birmingham College. In those days I didn't know whether I wanted to be a ceramic artist or a sculptor or a potter or anything. So I specialised in graphic design and I hated every moment of it. So I used to sneak off and go to the ceramic department. Fortunately, I had this wonderful woman who believed in me and she let me do exactly what I wanted to do. So I never studied ceramics, I only played with ceramics, which was great, it was much more fun. When I was a very poor art student, I used to spend my weekends going off to archaeological digs. And I was always fascinated by digging up bits of ceramics and putting them together. And he gave me the idea of the way to work. My girlfriend and I decided to get out of Birmingham. We went down to Cornwall and eventually I opened a studio. I never thought I would make a living being an artist. In 1972, I was invited to go to Africa, into a wonderful country which I had no idea existed, called Lesotho, who were looking for young potters to set up potteries out in Africa. The people were absolutely wonderful and I fell in love immediately with Africa and we set up a pottery in an old brewery. I taught them how to throw and we built kilns and we had a little industry going. I did this for three years and I was quite content but I had a feeling that it would be better if they were to use people like myself to go to the mountains where the people lived rather than bringing all the people down into the urban places. I wrote this report and it was picked up by the Commonwealth Secretariat who gave me a three-year contract. It was a wonderful job. I travelled all over Lesotho on horseback and I visited all these little villages and watched the people make ceramics. And at that point, I decided that I was going to learn more than I would teach. These pots were absolutely beautiful and the old women used to decorate them with a design called titiba and using a pointed stick. They used to do these incredible patterns all over the surface. I was fascinated by this technique and I tried to use it in my own creations. After 10 years in Africa, we decided we must come back to England because of the children needed educating we decided not to go back to Cornwall. Bath was going to be our home from now on. My process is quite a strange way of doing work because a lot of artists work for perfection. I quite like the imperfection of ceramics and therefore I do tend to break my pieces, put them back, add glass or copper and it's a more of a construction. It's a more of an archaeological piece. Every bit of clay is different. 
every morning is a bit different. And it's just a matter of kind of find, getting your sort of equilibrium, and kind of find, find out what you want to do. But the thing is, you must not overthink it, or you can be too clever. So the idea is to work fairly quickly. Simple things are the best things to do. So it's just a matter of making strokes. Get a little bit of the rhythm going. Using old tools, I make a lot of my own tools, using just very, very simple things. Let the clay speak, let it happen. I think you can overdo things. Just use the clay for what it is. Each clay has got its own feeling. You need the fingerprint of the artist to go in. There's nothing very clever about it. Just do different strokes. Get a bit of a rhythm going. I like the Japanese, three to one. Get the three strokes there. Stop and have a look at it. You can roll it, flatten the clay out a little bit. Then you start building the textures up. I've got a bit of a landscape going, I think. Um, it's, uh, it's starting to work well, but I just feel like I need something at the top. So I'm gonna get, grab some clay, roll it out. And I'm gonna put some waves in. It needs a little bit of movement at the moment. It's a little bit stiff. But I just want it to start dancing. So I'm gonna make it dance. It's either waves or clouds, I don't know, but it... So let's do that. And roll it out again. Ah, got a little thing going there. Okay. I'm happy with that. I think it's gonna work. But the best thing to do now is walk away, go and have a little walk, come back half an hour later, see if you still like it. Sometimes I miss pieces out, sometimes I add pieces too. But it's all to do with making the story of the piece. I also fire pieces in different parts of the kiln and then put them back together in different ways. So you get a kind of a hodgepodge of textures. And this gives a state of history with my work. I have this wonderful clay shipped over from Australia. It's a very, very pure white porcelain. I fire it very high and I can get a translucency to it. And a lot of my work is to do with opposites. Therefore, I use rough river clay against very smooth clay. It's a kind of the yin and yang of life, you know, the rough and the smooth. I like people to touch my work, feel the textures, look at the piece, roll it around in your hand. I actually put a lot of my pieces in the river. I put coatings of iron and copper on my pieces. I leave them in the water for about six or seven weeks, then take them out, and the water has reacted with the coppers and irons and made a wonderful patina. And if they're not ready, I put them back in for another few weeks and toss them around the water, and I get these wonderful textures on my work. Justin, my son, has been working for me for about the last 15 years. And he's become a very, very good technical person and he arranges all the exhibitions, the websites and Facebook and tweets, everything I hate doing. Many years ago, I tried rakuing, which is a Japanese method of making pots, which is very, very exciting because it's all to do with fire, water and earth. And I do like those combinations to work with. I did Raku for a few months and I got tired of it very, very quickly because there were so many other good artists that could do far better than I. And I was trapped to the process. 
and I didn't want a process to trap me. So I left these pieces for a few years and then one day I discovered them and I thought I've got to do it again my way. I started grinding the pieces down and I discovered underneath the textures there were wonderful surfaces. So I've developed this over a period of time and I've made my Raku into an art form which is unique to me. Travel is an integral part of my inspiration. A few years ago, I had a lovely commission to do, and they asked me if I would like to do it out in India. I thought about it for a long time, and decided, yes, I would love to make it in India. The people that commissioned me gave me this wonderful studio. I built a kiln out there, and I've been going for the last seven years. I like the fun of making. I don't mind whether things go right or wrong. I want people to look at my work and say, was that made yesterday or was it made 2,000 years ago? I want my work to give more questions than answers.